from coast to coast and worldwide on the Internet. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. It is, and you're about to be presented with, for your consideration, one of the greatest minds in the world today, Dr. Michio Kaku. He is an internationally recognized authority in theoretical physics and the environment. He holds the Henry Summit professorship in theoretical physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Has lectured round the world, and his Ph.D. level textbooks are, in fact, required reading at many of the top physics labs worldwide. Dr. Kaku graduated from Harvard in 1968 and looked loud number one in his physics class at that. Received his Ph.D. from the University of California Berkeley Radiation Laboratory in 1972. Held a lectureship at his goal is to help complete Einstein's dream of a theory of everything. That would be a single equation, perhaps, no longer than one inch, like your thumb. A little shorter, actually, which will unify all the fundamental forces in the universe. Coming up in just a moment. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Kaku, welcome to the program. Nice to be back, Art. Oh, it's so nice to have you here. It really is. Uh, it's always just a blast. Before we get into what we're going to talk about, I've got a couple of listener kind of questions that I'd like to try and come on you with and okay. just see what your reaction is. Okay. We've talked about um, quantum this and quantum that on the show a lot of times. And uh, uh, so this listener... Ask, wants to know from you if a quantum bomb, always thinking about stuff blowing up, right? Uh, but if a, if a quantum bomb would be theoretically possible, and if it is, this listener suggests that it would uh, be of such a magnitude that it would collapse all dimensions around us and uh, create what he calls an infinite chain reaction. That's pretty scary. I mean, is such a thing even possible? Well, you know, quantum mechanics is basically the theory of the atom, um, otherwise known as atomic physics or nuclear physics. And we already use uh, quantum mechanics to create the atomic bomb. Uh, the atomic bomb is a direct consequence, not only of E equals MC squared, but of uh, the quantum theory devised in the 1920s and 1930s. So in that sense, the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb are quantum bombs. However, this person is trying to hint that perhaps there's a bomb that could shatter space and time itself. That's right, yes. And at, at the present time, we know of no such thing. Uh, even a black hole, for example, which would contain perhaps the largest concentration of energy in our sector of the galaxy, even a black hole does not set off a chain reaction. Now, remember that Einstein himself, back in the 1920s, speculated that E equals MC squared may be able to make a bomb, but he didn't understand the chain reaction process back in the 1920s. That allows you to magnify a very tiny amount of energy into, into a bomb. Now, even though we have black holes, in fact, we've now seen uh, you know, about uh, a few hundred of them with the Hubble Space Telescope, and perhaps hundreds of thousands with the Chandra X-ray telescope, mm -hmm. uh, we know of no mechanism that can create a chain reaction. That is one black hole setting up another black hole setting up another black hole. So I think for the present time, uh, we have to rest assured that there's no such thing as a, as a quantum bomb. However, an antimatter bomb, that would be perhaps the largest source of energy release that you could create with with modern technology, perhaps 100, 200 years in the future. Can we even uh, speculate on what would happen if somebody set off an antimatter bomb? We could speculate. Uh, a teaspoon of antimatter combined with ordinary matter would mm -hmm. give you uh, up to 100% energy efficient conversion, and that would be enough to uh, blow any modern city off the face of the Earth. If you had antimatter, for example, the size of a good house or an apartment house, That'd be enough, perhaps, to crack the earth in half. So then, 
Um, well, let me ask you this, antimatter, um, suppose we had a teaspoon of it, would we then concoct it into a bomb, physically following uh, the design of the current bomb, where, you know, you've got two balls of what, uh, of plutonium, and you plutonium. smash them together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at a very high speed. Well, if you had antimatter and, and matter, would you do essentially the same thing, just suddenly bring the two together? And, and before I can even ask that, how would you contain the antimatter in anything if you thrust it toward the matter? Yeah, well, there is a difference. With ordinary atomic bombs, you need critical mass. Uh, this is what Hitler did not understand back in the 1930s and early 40s. He did not understand one number which could have determined the fate of World War II. One number? That one number is the amount of plutonium necessary to sustain a chain reaction. Uh -huh. uh, today we know that it is about 20 pounds of uranium and perhaps half that of plutonium. So, uh, but Hitler didn't know that number. He thought it may be tons of enriched uranium. So he, he shelled the atomic bomb project and instead went for the V2 project and the V1, that is, the, uh, the ballistic missile and the, the cruise missile. So luckily, Hitler did not know that number, or else he may have tried to have a crash program to build the atomic bomb. How did we figure out that number? Uh, well, we, on the other hand, had reactors, and we, had, we could play with certain amounts of plutonium, and we knew the rate, the cross-section, the rate at which uranium fissions. Uh, that's what the Germans did not know. They did not know the, what is called the effective cross-section. Uh, Werner Heisenberg, of the famous Heisenberg and Certain Principle, mm -hmm. uh, was the one who essentially goofed. Um, the, uh, the debriefing after 1945, when the Allies captured uh, Werner Heisenberg, the debriefing papers have now been pretty much declassified. You can read them. And uh, we, we realized that when he was debriefed uh, after being captured, uh, Heisenberg did not know that number. Uh, the first thing he asked was, what was the size of the carrier of the Hiroshima bomb? That was huh. the first thing he asked. Huh. He didn't know whether it was a ship or not. When he was told that it was a B-29 bomber, he knew the size of the bomb bay, and therefore he estimated the size of the bomb, and then mentally he worked backwards. He worked backwards in his mind as he was being interrogated to figure out what the, the neutron cross-sections were for the atomic bomb. He, he essentially <laughs> did not know the answer. He goofed. Uh, so Luckily, uh, but we essentially gave him the answer in interrogation. That's right. Once we told wow. him the wow. size of the Hiroshima bomb, being the genius that he was, he mentally computed backwards. Uh, he thought a gigantic ship would be required to, to deliver an apartment-sized atomic bomb uh, mm -hmm. on an enemy. He didn't realize that an atomic bomb, the plutonium and uranium, is basically the size of your fist. Hmm. Now, an antimatter bomb does not have critical mass. Uh, any amount of antimatter would instantly uh, combine and release enormous amounts of energy.